Thank you so much and good morning. And thank you, Ellen, for this very generous introduction and for the promotion for the book. You know, that always helps. Uh, and good morning to you all, ladies and gentlemen. I am coming from Turkey uh, with my wife, Riyada, and we are on this 30-day long book tour in the United States, which involves some 17 cities, which means basically we're changing a hotel in a city practically every night. So last night I was in Kansas City, so I woke up here today and we'll be heading to war towards Dallas. Uh, and it's a tiring tour, but it's great because I love interacting with uh, people, the people of the United States, because every time I go, I find people who are willing to listen and, and you know, maybe if, even if they disagree, they want to converse. And that's a great thing because you don't have that everywhere, every, you know, every time in the world. Uh, so let me, let me appreciate that first. Uh, and uh, I should say also tonight we're having another event, like a dinner, that's also interesting. And there I will speak actually more about the very topic of my book, whether there could be an Islamic liberalism. Uh, and the theory for that is about my book. But tonight, today, uh, I'll speak a little bit more into, you know, the more boring politics of the Middle East because, you know, that's what the topic is. Uh, and the title is whether, you know, what next after Tunisia and Egypt, where the Arab Spring is going. But I always believe in the power of history. So before telling you what's next, I'll tell you what was there before, <laughs> how we came to this historical epoch that is called the Arab Spring. Some people start to call it the Arab Winter, but you know, I still stick with the word to be optimistic at least a little bit, the Arab Spring. Well, in the beginning, there was the Ottoman Empire. Uh, what we call the Middle East today, I mean, actually the Middle East and the Balkans today, from Yugoslavia to Yemen was the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it was, Luckily, you know, centered in where I live, Istanbul. But it was a huge multi-ethnic, multi-religious empire covering this West land for about six centuries. So all the Middle Eastern countries that we've been discussing about in the past century, Libya, Algeria, Egypt, Tunisia, Israel, Palestine, Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, all of them were the Ottoman Empire until World War I. Uh, well, there was a time in the world history that empires collapsed and disintegrated, and it happened to the Ottoman Empire as well. It happened to the Aust uh, Austrian uh, Habsburg Empire too. And bad things happen when multi-ethnic empires collapse. Peoples of the empires start to claim a national homeland and want to secure that homeland, and it leads to national conflicts and, and sometimes wars, and that happened as well. And many people of the empire, sometimes Turks, sometimes Armenians, suffered from that disintegration. But whatever, it, it fell, and with World War I, a new Middle East emerged with different nation states. Uh, so states like Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Palestine, Saudi Arabia, they all came to be formed right after World War I. And they were formed by actually not most of the time the peoples of the region themselves, but by the British or the French who, you know, sat down and said, okay, let's create this country called Syria here. And Syria will be, oh, you, you guys get it, the French get it, and we'll get, the, uh, we'll get uh, like Iraq. And let's divide Palestine, Transjordan, you know, all of them. So, and that's why when you look at the map of the Middle East, you will see some borders that are clearly you know, divided by, like, it was made by like a pencil on the map. There's no natural border, no like a river or any, like a mountain or anything. Uh, and, and so what, so there, this region still carries the legacy of that somewhat artificial borders. Uh, when do I, what do I mean by artificial borders? For example, the border between Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. When you go to border, you will see families who are on both sides of the barbed wire. You will see Kurdish families here, Kurdish families here, their relatives, but just one day a barbed wire passed through them and the government came and said, this is the border. They didn't know what a border was before. So that's, for example, that's why today the Kurds, the largest ethnic group in the Middle East, is divided between Turkey, Iraq, and Syria, and Iran because they, they used to be one 
people of the empire, but they were divided into different states. And when you go to, that's why in Syria today, you would find different groups, ethnic groups, living together, whereas there is some of their relatives live in Syria, not, not in Syria, but Iraq. So there is, this, there is a problem with the real uh, realities of ethnicity and sects versus the borders that were created in World War I. Some people think that the Middle East will be better when borders change. Well, I'm not arguing that because changing borders sometimes is also a very troubling thing which can lead to wars. But just we have this problem with these kind of almost artificial states that were created in World War I. Uh, another problem is that after World War I, you had some 27 states when you, compete the, when you count the Balkans too, emerging from the Ottoman Empire. Uh, some of them became republics, some of them were continued as monarchies. But the one major problem is that most of these countries did not, did not become independent countries. They became colonies of uh, European powers, mostly the French or the British or the Italians. And when you have a colonial rule, what do you have as a response? You have anti-colonial sentiment and ideology. Uh, so the West, for many people in the region, became an enemy to fight or intruder to resist. That is why the more liberal-leaning political thoughts that had emerged in late Ottoman Empire, and that's a forgotten story, you know, I get into my book a little bit. Uh, great uh, Arab historian Albert Hurani has a book about it titled Liberal Age in Arab Thought that was late 19th century, early 20th century when Ottoman, Turkish, or Arab intellectuals were looking at the West and getting some inspiration from Western democracy, trying to incorporate those democratic ideals into their you know, nations. That's why the Ottoman Empire had opened up a parliament in 1876, declared Jews and Christians as equal citizens. In Tunisia, there was a lot of reform. Tunisia abolished slave, uh, slavery before, a little before the United States, so, you know, some, st st uh, some states in the United States. So there was an actually a liberal era before that, you know, World War I and the new formation. But when with colonialism, in the minds of the peoples of the Middle East, the West and Western systems, including liberal democracy especially, became something to be skeptical about. And more defensive reactionary ideologies emerged. They emerged in the form of sometimes Arab socialism or Arab nationalism and ultimately Islamism, which is a interesting mix of it, commitment to traditional Islam, but with a political ideology, or it, like turning into Islam into a political ideology, you know, that, that also emerged in the 20th century Middle East. Uh, these colonized states gradually, of course, became decolonized. Uh, after especially the Second World War, with the general era of decolonization in the world, in Africa and elsewhere, like the, if, uh, Syria or Iraq or Egypt, and Palestine, you know, became uh, countries that, uh, you know, they got rid of their colonial uh, masters and they, they gained their independence. However, gaining independence was always not a blessing too because what came after independence was not most of the time a liberal democracy with different political parties competing with each other. It just became one party states. So after independence, what happened in Syria or Iraq, for example, is that a party, a single party called the Ba'ath Party, the Arab Nationalist Socialist Party, they dominated the scene. They disallowed any other political party, and, and you had a wave of authoritarianism in the, in, the, in the region. It was not an accident that most of these newly emerging authoritarian states were allies of the Soviet Union, you know, the, in the Cold War context. Uh, I mean, they, they've they were drawn into that because of the tension with Israel and because Israel was an American ally, but also because of the fact that in their own political vision, being one part of states, you know, being an ally of the Soviet Union, which was another, the pure example of a one party authoritarian, almost totalitarian, not almost totalitarian state, also, you know, were, uh, made sense to these political systems. Uh, some, as I said, some of these uh, authoritarian states were Republics, but not every republic on earth is actually a democratic thing. North Korea is called the Republic of you know, North Korea. Some of them were secular leading. They had secularist you know, worldviews. 
again, secularity is not a guarantee for democracy or liberalism. North Korea is secular, to, to remind again. Uh, and uh, so very few countries in the region had a chance to experiment with really participatory democracy, at least even electoral democracy, in the sense that you could have different political parties. And Turkey was one of them, and I'll come to Turkey you know, in, a, in a bit when I explain these things. So these authoritarian structures continued. And, uh, one, one dichotomy that haunted this whole saga in the Middle East throughout the 20th century was that when you had more secular-leaning Arab uh, or uh, Persian, when it comes to Iran, the authoritarianisms, you had Islamic groups that resisted these authoritarian states. For example, in Egypt, the main uh, Islamic Islamist uh, movement was born in 1920s in the trauma of this post-Ottoman, you know, directionlessness of the Middle East. Because with the Ottoman Empire, the caliphate had also been managed and Muslims had, had a sense of crisis, they, like they didn't have a sense of direction. So the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt was founded in 1928 was by Hassan al-Banna, uh, and their slogan was that Islam is the solution. Well, the Quran, if you ask me, the Quran doesn't say Islam is the solution to your, you know, like a traffic problem. It says Islam is a guidance for those who believe in God, a guidance for afterlife and morality. But, you know, Islamists turn Islam into a political system saying Islam is the solution. We will solve all our problems by referring to Islam. But anyway, this was an ideology created by the, and I, in my book I explain how transformation from more classical traditional Islam, where it focuses more on God and afterlife, Two, this political Islamism where it focuses on how can we be better than the capitalists and the socialists, like in, in a very like a ideological formation, how it took place you know, in, the, in the 20th century. But anyway, the Islamists, they were born first in Egypt, then you know, the Muslim Brotherhood was replicated in Jordan, in Syria, in Tunisia with different names sometimes and colors and shades. These were the people that who thought that Islam gives you the, the necessary political vision. Well, that's a political idea, and in a democracy, you would have these people joining the elections and, you know, come to power if they win and try their ideas, and if they are wrong, they would be taken out of power, right? That would be, that would be the evolution of a healthy democracy. Some of their ideas were very conservative. They wanted to ban alcohol, for example, for everybody. Well, in a democracy, maybe you ban alcohol a little bit and you learn that it's actually not helping anybody, it just creates mafia, and you change your mind. I think it's how it happened here <laughs> in the United States. So being ex able to experiment with even some hardcore beliefs you have, you know, actually gives you the right to, you know, give you the chance to evolve, you know, and learn from your mistakes. But unfortunately, the Islamists did not have that chance for a long time because they were always oppressed by their secular but not liberal or democratic rulers. Uh, in, in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood was oppressed by the dictatorship of Nasser, then by uh, Sadat. Sadat had to try to a little bit co-opt them, but it didn't work well. And then after Sadat, by Mubarak, Husni Mubarak, which created this one-party, single-state Egypt and oppressed the Islamists. Oppressed the Islamists in the sense of, of like putting them into jail, getting them tortured. And some of the Islamists who suffered this authoritarianism by the uh, secular autocrats, they start to become even more radical because they said, we are our utopia, we have to come to power, they don't allow us, we will fight. That is how these armed Islamist groups that are called jihadis later were born, in the sense that they were born out of this lack of democratic space. The fact that they were oppressed and they were not allowed to participate in, in the political system made them growing more radical. And unfortunately, that's the roots of even Al-Qaeda. I mean, the, the mastermind of Al-Qaeda, a horrible terrorist organization which committed unspeakable crimes against a lot of innocent people, including Americans, was born when, uh, partly when Ayman al-Zawahiri, its mastermind, was tortured in Husn Mubarak's prisons in the 80s. And he decided, well, we will fight. We can't lose time with this democratic nonsense. Uh, we will, you know, wage a war, and not just the Mubarak's of the world, but also their Western allies, and that's the formation of the ideology of Al-Qaeda. I'm saying this not to 
justify anything, God forbid, but to say there was a political poisonous political context which you know created all these problems in the Middle East. The burning problem was a lack of a pluralist democracy in which people could express their views and compete with each other. And, and, and when the Islamists uh, took hold, you know, when they came to power with some means, they all actually imitated the authoritarianism of their secular oppressors. One great example to see this is actually Iran. Not an Arab country, but obviously an important country in the Middle East. Uh, it's actually a country with like a lot of history and like a, a very long established civilization, but it has been a country without any liberal democracy for a long time. And, and, and it has oscillated between secular authoritarianism and Islamist authoritarianism. What do I mean by this? Well, uh, as I explained in my book in Iran, the 20th century Iran was shaped mostly by the two shahs, the shah the father and shah the son, you know. One, was, uh, one came to power in the uh, 1920s by overthrowing the Qajar dynasty, like an established dynasty in Iran, uh, and he was there until World War II, and after World War II, uh, there was a period of Mossadegh, he was overthrown, well, with a little bit of help of CIA, and President Obama actually you know, said that it was a mistake you know, when, when he was, was speaking about uh, reconciliation between Iran and USA, but then after came the second Shah, and he was overthrown with the Iranian Revolution. Now the Shah, both Shahs, they were modernists. They wanted to modernize their nations and they did good things in that regard. They built the country, built highways and roads and brought modern education, but they were authoritarian. They did not allow anybody else to compete with them and you know, express their ideologies. Also their authoritarianism turned into a secular authoritarianism in the sense that they wanted to, for example, ban some Islamic practices and especially the most controversial issue in the Middle East all the time, the Islamic headscarf. Uh, in 1920s, uh, the Shah, the father, Reza Shah, he said, well, he saw some of the reforms in Turkey, you know, about the you know, dress code has changed, and he said, I can do better than this. And he said, well, the headscarf uh, that Muslim women wear traditionally is a sign of backwardness, and we will get rid of that. And what he do for that? He ordered the police to unveil every woman in Iran. Uh, and po police started to attack and harass women and to tear their way off. Women hid in their homes to you know, get away from this police harassment. Uh, Ayatollahs, the religious uh, clergy, condemned the Shah and depicted him as a great tyrant on Islam attacking the faithful. The Shah got some Ayatollahs executed, whipped, he actually manhandled one of them when he entered a mosque with his boots and created a big trauma in Iran. And the first terrorist movement in the Middle East uh, in the name of Islam was created in 1930s in Iran called the Fada'iyani al-Islam, which means the devotees of Islam, which wanted to take revenge from the Shah on his attack on Islam. And that is the roots of the Khomeini movement. That was revived in the 70s under Khomeini, the same Fada'iyani Islam movement. And when Khomeini came to power with a revolution, a uh, violent revolution, in uh, popular but also turned violent revolution in 1979, what do you say? Now the woman will put the headscarf on. The Shah was forcing women to put the headscarf off. Now Khomeini decided that everybody will wear it. Unfortunately, none of them said, let the woman decide what they want to do. <laughs> It's a, that very common sense liberal solution, unfortunately, was not the norm in Iran. It still is not. Uh, and that was the burning problem that, I mean, the region oscillated between these uh, so-called modernist or progressive or secularist dictatorial regimes versus the Islamists who resisted them. And the more Islamists got oppressed, the more radical they got, and you had this vicious cycle. As I said, Turkey was able to move away from this vicious cycle, and I'll come to Turkey in a second, but something luckily hap something happened in, t in 2011. Well, before that, Saddam Hussein was overthrown by the United States, and that maybe initiated some change uh, in the region, but uh, if you ask me, I think all the, I'm happy that Saddam is gone in Iraq, but the Iraq war itself was a historic mistake because it initiated a lot of tension, civil war in that country, and led to a lot of suffering both on the American side and on the, on the Iraqi side as well. So I'm just leaving the Iraq war aside here right now. In 2011, in Tunisia, 
one of those countries which is a republic and a secular leaning republic, no Sharia or anything, but which is authoritarian in which women who wear the headscarf were again banned and oppressed by the state. The dictatorship led by Ben Ali, a uh, very Francophile you know, dictatorship, dictator, sorry. He, uh, his rule was there for decades and it, it, it all started with one man, Mohammed Bo Azizi. He was a young man, university graduate, who couldn't find a decent job, and he was selling produce, vegetables on the street with a little cart. He was hopeless. He was trying to you know, look after his uh, his mom, who was who was uh, who, who couldn't walk, who was you know, paralyzed, and his sister. So he was a man really struggling with this unfortunate you know society, this unfortunate political system. Because Tunisia, in in all these societies, when you have one party. What happened is that you don't really have an economic opportunity unless you know somebody in that party. I mean, it's not a free market economy that you can really create a job and work for it. And, and in America, you have this great idea that if you work, you, you, you win. I mean, if you work, you make money. And if you work hard, you get benefit. I mean, you get the results for that. It was not the case in Tunisia. It's not, it's not the case in many countries. So when his, uh, he was harassed by the police and his, uh, his uh, little cart was broken and by a, like a police officer because he didn't give the bribes, he got so frustrated. He went to the police station. He tried to tell a story. Nobody listened to him. He said, if you don't listen to me, I'll burn myself. And he did. He burned himself alive in, in, in a main street in Tunisia. And his agony, his tragedy, became the, became the initiator of a much larger wave in Tunisia. People start to hear about this. Well, how did they hear about this? Through the internet, Twitter, Facebook. Well, in the old days, you wouldn't have these. You would only have the state newspaper, right? And when you have the state newspaper, state newspaper tells you the things that are you know, approved by the state, that are helpful to the state. When you don't have a free independent media, you, you don't get real information about what's happening in society. So state media, of course, did not report about his mom at Boazizis. But now you have internet, you have Twitter, you have Facebook, just nobody can control it, and you know, information just spreads like wildfire. Thanks to that, thanks to that just technological advance, uh, this, uh, this event became a, like a, the, as I said, a trigger of a much larger reaction, like thousands and, and hundreds of thousands of Tunisians were out on the streets to oust the, uh, the, uh, the dictator Ben Ali, and they did. He fled the country, and Tunisia was the first country to defeat its dictator and enter into a process of democratic participation. They never had free and fair elections before. Now they would have free and fair elections, and the democratic game would begin. Then it happened in Egypt. The uh, masses in Egypt who got the idea from Tuni Tunisia. Well, the Tunisians can do it. Why not us? You know, because of that, they went on to Tahrir Square, as you know, deposed uh, President Mubarak, dictator Mubarak after 18 day long you know, protests. And uh, they have been successful in overthrowing their tyrant as well. In Libya, similar revolution began, but because Gaddafi, the thing is there are dictators that are a little rational, there are dictators that are totally irrational and crazy. So Gaddafi was of the second sort. So instead of like the other two who calculated that this is bleak and I should you know, leave the country, he said, well, but Mubarak didn't leave the country, but Ben Ali lived the country. He said, I'll fight to death and I will destroy all of you, 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 know, you like traitors and looters and so on and so forth. And that turned the Libyan uh, spring into a civil war because the, then the opposition, there, in Syria is a very tribal country, so it turned into a tribal warfare as well. Anyway, that civil war was Inter, I mean, there was an intervention by the international community. United Nations Security Council got a decision to create a no-fly zone over Libya. I think it was a smart move for the international community to do that. And after some NATO operations, like several, I mean, not, not more than several, but a lot of uh, sorties and some Gaddafi targets were bombed, the Libyan revolution could succeed as well. Unfortunately, Gaddafi was not put on trial. He was lynched, and that was horrible. Uh, but Libya also, you know, created this transformation. Uh, things got much worse in Syria, because in Syria, the regime proved much more uh, powerful, much more resilient than others. 
and the regime had much stronger friends than others. Iran and Russia, two important countries in the region, uh, are the willing supporters of the tyranny in Syria led by Bashar Assad and his Ba'ath party. That's why the Syrian uh, would-be revolution turned into a very bloody civil war and the, the regime used very brutal means to subdue the population. Uh, what, what, what got worse over time is that the Syrian opposition, which began as a you know, movement for democracy and you know, re democratic revolution in Syria, was joined by more radical uh, fanatic groups that came outside of Syria to fight in Syria, groups like Al-Qaeda. So that's why in Syria we have a big tragedy right now, whereas the regime is brutal and it is trying to break the opposition by using all means possible. Whereas the opposition has legitimate elements in my eyes, but also some very concerning elements that have joined as well. And Syrian civil war is going on, and that's the most traumatic case. We can speak, if you want, a little bit more about this uh, in the Q&A session. But let's go back to Tunisia and Egypt, what happened in these countries. They are not, neither Tunisia or Egypt in a very good shape right now. Tunisia is still doing better than everybody else in the region, I mean, all of these countries. Why? Because these are not societies that are used to having democracies. Don't forget that the French Revolution, the most glorified revolution, I'm not a big fan of the French Revolution, by the way, but I think the American Revolution was much nicer and uh, much less bloody and uh, with much nicer outcomes. But the French, after the French Revolution, you had so many years of trauma, the reign of terror and you know, dictatorship and Napoleon coming back. And it is not that easy to establish a democracy in any nation. And you, you establish a democracy by having experiments, by learning, by having a failure, by sometimes uh, polarizing so much that actually you start to fight each other. I mean, there was a civil war in this country, right? I mean, at some point. But then wise leaders like Lincoln build a new vision out of that civil war. So it, it, we should also, of course, always see that. And I, that's why I don't just join the pessimists who say, oh, no, democracy doesn't work here in Tunisia or elsewhere. So I think we should allow these societies to have these experiments. The West, I mean, particularly Europe, didn't come to liberal democracy right away. Uh, actually, Europe has a very nasty history. I mean, until the second world, end of the Second World War, first, uh, a lot of religious violence, you know, sectarian, I mean, then Protestants and Catholics killing each other for centuries, uh, a bit similar to some of the situation that's going on in Syria today. Uh, and then the religious wars ended, but nationalist wars began, First World War, Second World War. And I think the, at the end, the Europeans killed each other so much that they said, okay, let's find a political system in which we will not really kill each other anymore and we will actually live in harmony and tolerance and pluralism, and that's how the European Union and you know, the more liberal ideas dominated in Europe. So we should have that history in mind and to you know, look at these societies, I think, with this perspective. Uh, in Tunisia, what has happened since the revolution, Tunisia is still the best case of the Arab Spring. The Islamist party in Tunisia, called Nahda, it is, you can see it as a replica of the Muslim Brotherhood, but it's a more mo moderate, more liberal-leaning you know, version of the Muslim Brotherhood. The leader of Nahda party is Rashid Ghanoushi, an Islamic thinker that I really find uh, very important, and uh, I think he's a promising name for the uh, Islamic thought in the region, because he's, an, an, uh, he's a thinker who emphasizes that Islam cannot be imposed, and that's a very important thing for me. As a pious Muslim, I am very much against anybody who imposes Islamic, I, I'm not a pious Muslim, I, as a Muslim I should say, as a Muslim believer, I mean nobody should call themselves. As a Muslim believer, as a Muslim, I am very much against anybody who imposes piety uh, in the name of Islam. Like ha having a religious police and forcing people not to drink alcohol or or wear the headscarf and so on and so forth. I've seen this in Saudi Arabia, in, in Iran. What this creates is hypocrisy, not genuine religiosity. Uh, Islam and any other religion should be based on free choice, as I explain in my book. And Rashid Ghanoushi, for example, is an is a Islamic thinker who gets these. You know, he emphasizes Islam and democracy. He says Islam cannot be imposed. Apostasy, for example, a controversial issue in that part of the world, should be a right if you want to change your religion, you should be able to do that, which is not, you know, not everybody's opinion in that part of the world. 
and, and that's why the Nahda party has been more willing to uh, work with the secular parties in Tunisia and now the government resigned and there will be a lot of political tension going on but thank God they did not get into a civil war as some other countries did and in Tunisia there will be free and fair elections again a second round of elections in six months and Tunisia is working to you know build this democracy with the Islamists and other parties involved and that's how a democracy should work in Egypt what happened was that as a much uh, nice much less uh, bright much less inspiring story in Egypt what happened was that the, uh, after the uh, free, free, after the fall of the dictator Mubarak, there were free and fair elections, right? The Islamists, Muslim Brotherhood, and even more radical Islamists that we call the Salafis, they entered the democratic game. They were well organized. They had a lot of votes. They won the majority, and they got the, the parliament, and they got also majority in the constitution drafting, uh, like uh, assembly. And what happened was that they overplayed their hand a little bit, and they did not try to build a consensus that Nahda tried to do with the uh, secular groups in, uh, in Tunisia. And what happened was that then the secularists in Egypt, the so-called liberals and uh, nationalists and some of the remnants of the old regime, they went on the military to call on the military to say, we, we can't defeat them in the ballots. Why don't you come in, you know, take them out with, with, with a military coup? Uh, and that's why a military coup against the Muslim Brotherhood government took place in Egypt this summer. And I think it's a historic mistake for Egypt. Uh, because this coup, at, after which hundreds of protesters, peaceful protesters on behalf of the Muslim Brotherhood were shot dead by the military, only takes Egypt back to the old vicious cycle. There are Islamists who want to come to power with their political vision. You tell them democracy is the game, they enter democracy, and when they win the elections, you call the military to overthrow them and you know, get rid of them. Now, uh, Islamists might be making mistakes, and they are making mistakes in this process too, but the so-called liberals, I think, by calling on the military to you know, overthrow an elected government also made a huge mistake as well. And unfortunately, Egypt, has been drawn back to the vicious cycle that it was before the Arab Spring. Uh, so that's why Tunisia remains right now, I think, in these countries, the only good example. Libya is in a different state. Libya is not a real state. It's still a tribal confederation in many senses, and those tensions between tribes are going on. That's another thing. In some of the societies in the Middle East, you don't have a nation, but you have tribes, and their tension also creates a lot of uh, things. I, I think I have a few more minutes. Did I speak too much? How, what? Okay, before, yeah, I should leave more time for you. One thing, as I've been saying, I'm not a propagandist for Turkey. The fact that I'm Turkish, you know, doesn't blind me to the fact that there are a lot of problems in Turkey as well. But in Turkey, thank God, we have been able to escape from some of these vicious cycles. Because in Turkey, first, we were never colonized. That was a blessing. Uh, we ne that's why we never saw the West as the enemy, ultimate enemy. We were more fearful of the Soviet Union throughout the Cold War. That's we happily joined NATO, and I think it was a good decision. And tur that kept Turkey more in the uh, Western uh, like a sphere of politics, including the democratic system. Uh, secondly, Turkey has been experimenting with democracy since 1950. Actually, our democracy goes back to the Ottoman Empire era, but since 1950, we have free and fair elections. That's why Turkey's Islamic parties have able, been able to enter democracy and experiment with it. And if they want to win votes, they realize that they should open up to other branches of society. They should try to win the secular waters as well. That's why Turkey's Islamists, they might be too conservative or close-minded for Tur Turkey's secularists, but they're still democratic actors in the game. And you know, they're focusing on building the country rather than you know, trying to impose a religious police. Uh, and, and I think that is, the, if there's one lesson that is coming out of Turkey, one more lesson is that those Islamists in the Middle East who want to create these Islamic regimes for what? For making people more religious and pious. They should look at Turkey. Turks are still a very pious uh, Muslim society, but they have a secular state. The fact that they have a secular state didn't actually make Turkish society rest less religious. It made Turkish society only more genuinely religious. Because in Saudi Arabia, there's a religious police telling you to go to the mosque. In Turkey, you have a choice to go to the mosque or the nightclub. 
Some people choose a nightclub, you know, that's great, let them be happy. And many people still choose the mosque because they want to. And I think that freedom is the very basis on which any genuine religiosity can thrive. And I think that's the lesson that the Islamists of the Middle East, who always hope for some Islamic regime, I think should see. Well, more is in my book, and thank you so much for your atten uh, attention and your patience. And if you have questions uh, and comments, I would love to get. Thank you. We, we do have time for some questions. If you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. Yes, ma'am. Could you make a comment about the um, refugee situation from Syria and how that's affecting Middle East countries who are having to take those refugees? Great question. Uh, right now, there are more than 600,000 refugees from Syria inside Turkey only. Uh, there are similarly high numbers in Jordan and Lebanon and partly in Iraq. So more than a million people, actually almost two million people are outside of Syria as refugees. Uh, the Turkish government from day one, they said they have an open border policy with Syria because the Turkish government position was that we care for people, innocent people's lives. If people are running away from slaughter and coming to our doors, we won't close our border. And I think that's a good thing that the Turkish government did. Uh, that's why we open our borders and welcome the Syrian refugees. Uh, and the camp, Turkish government opened huge camps for Syrian refugees. These are camps that were praised by Angelina Jolie, who visited you know, us, and that was nice to have her and smile to cameras. But, that's, but we're left alone. <laughs> Nobody is helping us further to deal with this. But the you know, Turkish government is doing its best to really provide health care and uh, and, and, and like food and you know, all, all the services to people. But one question in Turkey is that what are we going to do with all these people? I mean, will they remain in Turkey forever? How long will the civil war last? If it lasts for a decade, will they become gradually Turkish over time? Will they become citizens? Uh, these are the questions that you know, some people in Turkey are asking. Uh, and, uh, and in that sense, and of course, some of the refugees are people whose families and whose families have been killed, slaughtered by the regime. So some of them are actually very active. They want to go back and fight. Sometimes they do that. And that's another tension you know, or like a topic inside Turkey. We're hosting refugees, but are some of them fighters? If some of them are fighters, like should we be hosting the fighters as well? That's another uh, political discussion that's going on. So I must say, like, I have my criticisms to the current government in Turkey on some foreign policy issues. But with regards to Syria, they think they did their best, especially with refugees, to really be a humanitarian uh, force in the region. Uh, and uh, there, was a, there was a time that Turkish foreign minister was saying 100,000 refugees is a red line for us. Well, it's 600,000 refugees now. Well, red line doesn't mean we'll close the border. But well, we were hoping that there would be something against the regime by the United States or the international community, which doesn't happen either. So we're left alone with, with the situation. Uh, so people generally ask me, what do you foresee about Syria? And I'm saying, well, I don't foresee anything. Because anybody who said, this is my prediction about Syria, has been proven wrong. The, the, the most popular prediction was that Assad will fall in weeks, then months. Well, it's been two years, almost three years now. Uh, I, I very much sympathize with the original opposition and their you know, aspirations for a free democratic Syria. But I also think now that the current bloodshed can be stopped only by some diplomatic a solution when uh, the patrons of the regime, uh, Russia and Iran, can be persuaded to pressure the regime for a less aggressive role, and and the uh, patrons of the more fanatic forces within the opposition, the Qatar and Saudi Arabia, they can use their leverage on their the, the, the fighters they're sponsoring to be a little less aggressive and and a diplomatic solution. Uh, that's how Bosnia, the war in Bosnia ended when Milosevic, the butcher of the Balkans, was forced to have a diplomatic, uh, like a solution, a Dayton agreement. It was actually President Clinton, you know, who allowed that happen by ha having his uh, military campaign on the Serbian forces in the 90s. Uh, so anyway, that, that it, it is really hard to see, but I think I don't see anything better than right now other than some diplomatic uh, settlement between the different fighting forces. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. 
you. Um, my question is, I'm originally from Syria, and I'm, you know, I know what's going on there. I try to, actually. Uh, what's going on now, Al-Qaeda that's fighting over there, I mean, the people, the Syrians, the revolutionaries who went out the streets in the beginning, now are being um, hit by either Al-Qaeda or Bashar al-Assad regime. So they're kind of hopeless. The free Syrian and army is being hit by both sides. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. even not the, only the army, the people who were, like, you know, against fighting at all, just, you know, uh, peaceful protests and all that, um, they're being, I mean, even took to um, um, prisons by Al-Qaeda people and all that. What's the future for these people? I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, it is so unfortunate. And also it shows, well, I very much sympathize with Syria. I mean, I, I feel the pain of the suffering there. And uh, I'm glad to learn that you're from Syria. And Al-Qaeda and its ilk, similarly Salafi, Takfiri, Jihadi groups. These are, I mean, complicated terms. But Salafis are the most literalists. Uh, within Islamic jurisprudence, they can be nonviolent, and it's fine if they're that way, but they can be open to jihadi, uh, like a very aggressive fighting ideology, which becomes a problem. Then they become takfiri, which is another problem, which means they excommunicate other Muslims, and they say, you're not a real Muslim, and I have the right to kill you. Um, that is very much like the Middle Ages, in, in like where you had the crusaders killing fellow Christians, saying that you're not a real Christian. Uh, and actually, Turkish President Abdullah Gül made a speech a month ago saying that we might be entering the darkest ages of our own civilization. I mean, Christians suffered through this in the Middle Ages, and they learned from it. And it's, it's a long, long, long time gone story. But he said we might be entering a similarly horrible era. And the problem with al-Qaeda type of groups is that if you say, okay, they're fine, they're fighting the regime, but they can turn it against anybody else. And this... Now, some Al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda is turning against Turkey, too, because they think we are not supporting them or allowing them to have access to arms or we aren't uh, supporting the free Syrian army. That's why against those very radical fanatic groups like Al-Qaeda, all reasonable human beings, whether they should be Muslims, Christians, Jews, Buddhists, uh, secular people, they should be on the same page because human life is sacred, whomever attacks innocent human life, civilians, they should be condemned. Uh, and uh, I think the Syrian uh, war is becoming an eye-opener for maybe some Muslims, maybe who didn't, who haven't seen the trouble with that sort of extremism enough. Uh, yes, it's real, it's a problem, and really it's hurting innocent people in Syria right now. I can only pray for the future of Syria, I mean, and can't do much now. Uh, yes, sir? One second. Sorry. One second, oh, yeah, it. sorry. He's, yeah. And you, direct. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, what was the official language of uh, Turkey during the Ottoman Caliphate? The official language of Turkey? And also an, uh, a question that uh, how come Ataturk did not face any opposition from um, the fundamentalist or Islamists, you know, when he uh, tried to emulate, emulate the, the Western mm -hmm. model? Mm -hmm. Uh, the language of the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire did not have an official language until the first constitution, but the official language is mentioned in the first constitution, constitution of 1876, as Turkish. But it was a Turkish written with Arabic alphabet. And it was a Turkish that included a lot of words from Arabic and Persian. That's why that we call the language Ottoman language today. Uh, we had a language revolution in 1920s under Ataturk. The alphabet was changed from Arabic to Latin. And also a Turkish language institution was created to cleanse Turkish language from foreign words, especially the Arabic and Par Farsi words. I think that was a historical mistake. Uh, you shouldn't have an institution to redesign a language and let language to you know, unfold by its own dynamics. And I think that it impoverished our language to some extent. I mean, the Ataturk era had a lot of goodwill to westernize Turkey and, uh, you know, remodel it on the European uh, system, but it had some excesses, if you will. And I think this language revolution was one of them. The hat revolution was another, another of them. The bowler hat was made compulsory to wear by every state official. 
and you know, I think you shouldn't tell people what to wear. I mean, they should wear hats and uh, turbans, whatever, nothing. It's there. It's, it should be their call. It was not liberal. I mean, it was a westernizing, you know, revolution, but it was not liberal enough, I think. As for Ataturk, well, Ataturk, good question. Ataturk revolution didn't face any violent Islamist response because we didn't have Islamic fundamentalists in Turkey. <laughs> I mean, the Ottoman Empire had gradually already accomplished a lot of reforms. Turks were used to having a parliament. Turks were used to ha having secular laws. The Ottoman Empire initiated, established many secular laws and secular courts. Uh, women were already going to schools. So Atatürk, when Atatürk became, he brought further modernizing re uh, revolutions, but t Turkey was not you know, the Taliban of, of Afghanistan uh, at, at the era. It, was, it already had gone through s certain uh, phases of uh, uh, revolution. Secondly, in Turkish Islam, the state is always respected and almost venerated. It comes from the Ottoman era. So even if you don't like the guy who's out of the state, you don't fight the state. Uh, I mean, you can opt for and, and like a political, like a change for some peaceful means. That is why Turkey's conservative Muslims who didn't like some of the excesses of the Ataturk era, like the ban on the Hafez or Islamic Sufi orders, they did not organize a guerrilla army against the Kemal's regime. They just waited for free and fair elections. And in the first free and fair elections, they voted for the Democrat Party, which promised to soften the secularism of Ataturk to some extent, as they did, for example. And in this sense, Turkey, Turkey is Muslim. That's why they knew that there was a way out of the uh, system they didn't like at the ballots. But in Iran, there were never ballots. So the only way to get rid of the secular authoritarian system was a revolution which made things even worse. You know, and a, a different form of authoritarianism came. That's why I think that kind of evolution through democratic practice is, is I think, key in Turkish experience. Thank you. We have time for one more. This is great. Can we have more? Yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, you've provided an incredible amount of information. Uh, makes it very difficult to digest. So no, blah, blah, blah. Sorry, I'm saying. But uh, you did make the statement that in the authoritarian countries, it was very difficult for an individual to make a way for himself. Uh, and then uh, focused on the United States as a democratic country that clearly has, has shows how, how that can work, but as any parent of a young adult with a college degree or further education can tell you, it's very difficult to get a job except at McDonald's. And we also see this incredible polarization of our political parties. Would you dare to comment on the implications for whether we're really democratic or author authoritarian? <laughs> well, I should be wise enough not to, you know, comment on the United States. Uh, while I just flew in from Turkey six hours, like six days ago, to an American audience. Uh, but here, let me tell you what my feelings are about the U.S. I'm not American, obviously. I'm Turkish. Uh, I've just, I've never lived for a long time in the U.S. Too. I've just traveled many times for conferences and a little, a few fellowships. Uh, I see there are a lot of political problems here too. And I see that there has been a lot of political problems in your history, uh, the civil, before the civil rights movement. I mean, you can say democracy was flawed in the sense that not everybody was able to participate in that. Uh, and I see today that some of the polarization that is going on in the United States is not helping the United States. Uh, the recent government shutdown because of the tension between Republicans and Democrats, that was not the best promotion for a democracy of checks and balances. I'm someone who advocates we need more checks and balances in Turkey. And people say, is this what you call checks and balances? They just can't get their thing together and their government gets bankrupt you know, for weeks. Uh, in this sense, but on the other hand, there are so many things, political values in the United States that I admire. The founder principles, the constitution, the idea that every man is created equal, the idea that there are God-given inalienable rights. That's a very important, profound insight. And I think the same insights comes from Islam, but we Muslims haven't worked on it enough yet. That's why I'm you know, pushing that idea a little bit in my book. 
uh, the idea that religious freedom, that everybody should be able to practice their religion without any harassment from the state. Uh, the idea that you, freedom of speech, you can say anything basically what you like and unless you call directly for violent action. I think these are profound experiences. And another thing, just a welcoming attitude. I mean, in the US, you just, you're in the elevator with somebody, you say, hi, he says, hi, where are you from? Blah, blah, blah. Like, this doesn't happen everywhere in the world. This is great. I mean, I like this. It's a country of immigrants, probably, and everybody was always welcome. In other societies, you're always a stranger. In the US, you feel like as if you're part of the society. These are all the great things. Uh, and another thing, the success of democracy in the United States and the keeping the openness of the United States is important for all of us. Therefore, when I sometimes see Islamophobic voices in the US, I feel sad because I was like, this is the country we're showing as an example to everybody. Like, this is the country we're showing as that you can be a pious Muslim and in the way you want and nobody harasses you, nobody looks at you in negative light. That's great. That's what, so, you know, one, well, let me tell you something. In one rally, a Islamophobic rally, honestly, I heard a slogan, an American walking with a slogan, if there are no uh, churches in Saudi Arabia, there should be no mosques here in the United States. I said, you're getting it wrong. We're trying to make Saudi Arabia like United States, not United States like Saudi Arabia. <laughs> so keep your good traditions and don't allow this fear of the other sometimes turn into a fear that really curbs individual rights. I think this happened during the McCarthyism era, you know, in the 50s from a different angle. I think it might, some people might be pushing it in a different level today uh, with regards to Islam. But I believe that the good people of the United States has the wisdom and the you know, uh, goodwill and the honesty to overcome those kind of, uh, some of the bigoted voices that I see in this country sometimes. Well, you, men you, you mentioned the book. Um, it is over here for sale, and he'll sign them copies for you. Thank you all for coming out uh, this afternoon. Mustafa, thank you so much. Thank you.